Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation uh, for engaging me into this workshop and speaking in the workshop. Uh, it's um, a great opportunity for myself to engage with this uh, fast developing community of tensor network computations. A little bit more words about myself and by my background. I'm coming from the computational fluid dynamics. Um, and over there, the traditional method is to use, um, it, it is to set up the grid points and to perform the traditional, that is, such as finite difference, finite element, uh, finite volume methods, and to evolve the PDEs uh, to predict the dynamics. And uh, in recent years, with my collaborators, uh, we uh, recognize the tensor network as a very useful tool to speed up the computation for the traditional methods in the CFD, computational fluid dynamics, and also the multi-scale um, PDE simulations. And this is uh, where I am coming from. And today I'm going to particularly talk about uh, adaptive rank integrators for nonlinear kinetic models that I have been working on in the past decade. And another keyword of uh, my work is the conservative. Uh, meaning that uh, for PDEs coming from fluid dynamics or kinetic models, we also care very much about conservations of macroscopic quantities, such as the local mass conservation laws, momentum conservation, and energy conservation. And when we perform the SVD truncation uh, to speed up our computation, how can we preserve uh, those physical conservation laws at the local level? Um, so this is another question that we try to address. Um, this is a joint work with uh, Wei Guo, uh, who should be here, from Texas Tech University. Um, my former uh, PhD student, Joseph Ninkao, uh, who is currently in Swasmo College, and the new collaborator, Louis Ankerma, from uh, University of Innsbruck. Uh, with Wei, uh, we uh, developed earlier on uh, explicit uh, time integrators uh, for, such, uh, for models such as the Velasov equation. With Joseph and Lucas, uh, we developed the implicit integrators, which I will cover um, in a later part of the talk. Um, so again, the scope uh, of my talk is to leverage the efficiency speed up from the tensor network representation uh, to speed up the traditional mesh-based uh, PDE solvers, uh, in particular uh, for the kinetic simulations. Um, I'm a bit uh, so the kinetic equations that we consider is a six dimension plus time, and this is considered high dimensional problems from my community. Um, and we are trying to solve this um, uh, nonlinear non six-dimensional problems. And uh, what we were trying to do is to, we try to uh, develop an adaptive rank uh, representation for the high-dimensional PDE solutions. And just in order to explain our ideas, I'm going to talk about things only in the matrix setting. But later on, we are going to extend it to the high-dimensional problems by the hierarchical tackle representation um, for the high-dimensional functions. And my talk uh, consists of um, these four main pieces. First of all, I'm going to talk about uh, how do we do the explicit in integration with the adaptive rank. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about how do we preserve the local macroscopic conservation laws by a particular projection. Um, thirdly, I'm going to talk about how do we perform the implicit or IMAX integration uh, to look for the basis and then the coefficients in the adaptive or low rank setting. And then uh, I will talk about uh, how do we extend to the high dimensional problems and show you our numerical results. All right, so this is uh, the kinetic models that we are considering. And in particular, this has um, the application area we uh, consider is the plasma physics. Um, here, F is the probability density of particles, where the subscript S here, it represented any particular species. It could be electrons or ions. So the F is the probability density function for the charged particle species S. It's a function of the time t uh, up to 3dx and then up to 3d in the velocity space. Um, 
This, the left hand side of this Boltzmann equation, it tells us that uh, the particles it transport with the velocity v, and then its velocity are accelerated or decelerated by the self induced electromagnetic field, which is in term de determined from this Maxwell equation, where the right hand side of the Maxwell equation coming from taking moments of my particle distribution functions. On uh, the right hand side, this uh, stands for the collisional terms. Uh, so in our strategy of uh, adaptive rank or low rank approximation to this probability density functions, we are going to, at least for the moment, we are going to use the explicit integrators for the Velasov part, and then we consider using the implicit integrators uh, for the right-hand side um, collisional terms. And uh, together, this could be an IMAX um, integration of our probability density functions forward in time. Again, this is a grid-based method. Sorry, what, could you say again what this C of F is? Uh, it's the collisional term. It describes uh, the particle collisions. It could be the focal plank operator uh, or different type of Boltzmann collision operators. Uh, I'm really ignorant. Just quick. Yes. What, what is this measuring? Just sort of um, it, physically? So physically, it's just uh, the particles, uh, how they collide with each other. What's the probability of they colliding each other? And that will, uh, that will be the right-hand side for the rate of change of the probability density for different species of particles. A relevant uh, question. So here, do you consider the linear collision operator or non-linear one? Linear, linear. Okay. I'm just uh, putting things into the context here. Yeah. But later on, uh, you will see that, oh, non-linear. Uh, so we have applied on the non-linear focal plank operator here. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. But this could be done through some type of linearization. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the nonlinearity come in both the E and B and as well as the yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It could. Um, all right. So the curse of dimensionality. Um, here we consider only the sixty plus time problem, uh, and the sixty is. Uh, a lot of dimension, at least from the community where I'm from, and uh, how people try to resolve it. There has been a sparse grid method. There is a reduced order modeling. And then uh, the approach we are taking is that uh, we take a look at this time-dependent function, and we try to explore the low rank structure in the uh, function of representation of this high-dimensional probability density function. Uh, there are two main approaches in evolving such type of PDE forward in time. Uh, one is the so-called dynamic low rank approach, which started more than a decade ago uh, in the European group. Uh, and what they do is that uh, they derive a set of differential equations, uh, and then they project uh, their dif uh, matrix differential equation uh, onto some tangent space uh, defined by the basis uh, for the low rank representation of, at the current time step, uh, and then they go from there. Uh, what we propose or the approach that our group has been adopting is what we call step and truncate. Um, it's really coming from the traditional grid-based method. That's where I am com coming from. Uh, taking that traditional grid-based method, uh, we perform, usually it's called a method of line discretization. Usually we first do the spatial discretization, and then we do the temporal discretization. We have a fully discretized system. Uh, the traditional method where update the solution in an element by element fashion does suffer from the curse of dimensionality. And here we are trying to assert that the solution could be of low rank into the scheme design. And instead of updating solutions element by element, we try to look for the basis from each of the dimension and then find the coefficients uh, for those. Whereas a dynamic low rank approach, um, the, the flow chart it follows is that typically it starts from the spatial discretization. They perform the low rank projection, and then they will do the temporal discretization from there. And there is usually associated with some type of um, operator splitting error. 
All right. Um, so this is uh, kind of the background. Now let's uh, let me uh, show you our strategy uh, in the explicit setting. And uh, just to simplify the discussion, we just consider the matrix setting where we consider just the one dimensional in the physics space and then one dimensional in the velocity space, the velocity equation. Uh, so for the Velasov equation, um, you can see uh, that uh, this is a Velasov equation, Ft plus V F sub X plus E F sub V equals zero, where the electrostatic field is determined from the Poisson equation. And uh, the low rank assumption that we assert here is that uh, um, our solution, um, our, our function, our PDE solution f as a function of x and v, they could be written as a linear combination of separable functions, uh, where the u1 of x, they are the basis in the x direction, they are also normal basis uh, in the x direction, and then u2 of v, they are also normal basis in the v direction. So at the discrete level, this is just the SVD of a matrix A, where the, the columns and then the rows of these matrices, they represent the basis for each respective dimension um, that we could uh, expand our solution upon. That's, that's the ansatz you make, or that's where you want to arrive at? Or? And this is the ansatz we made. With a fixed choice of view, or with a flexible choice of view? It's a, it's a, a problem dependent, it's a flexible choice of U. If we have a fixed choice of U, then it, it is a spectrum method, meaning that uh, it's like uh, the Fourier trigonometry functions or also um, normal uh, polynomial so functions. What I'm, what I'm more thinking is that, um, I mean, one thing is to pick a subspace spanned by a set of functions, right? But then you're doing some kind of Schmitt decomposition, right? Yeah, which, which I, I'm doing a this. specific basis in that space of functions. Yes. And I don't see why you would want to fix this in advance, right? Because this no, I'm means not. that you fix in advance that certain no. x and certain v functions yeah. have to be correlated and they can't be correlated to others. The, so do you fix that in advance? So that's why I have the superscript n here because the superscript n, it, uh, it, it's for at that time step tn. So this is at the TN. So for each of the snapshots in time, this basis, they will be different. But the space is fixed, so you say you... The, the space is not fixed. The is up to a certain order, and then... The, space is, it, the, the, the space is not fixed. Okay. It, it, so we will do the SVD truncation uh, step by step. But let's just say that the initial condition, you take a function, and let's say your initial condition, f of x, v, is let's say sine of x multiplied by uh, exponential of v. Uh, then one is the sine of x, the other is the exponential of v. Okay, and then you have a rank one representation of your initial condition. And then after that, the question is uh, how can we leverage the PDE dynamics to update my solution at the next time step? But now we still want to write it in uh, in this smish decomposition with a time dependent or problem dependent basis as we evolve. Will you say more about how you do that? Sorry? Will you say more about how you do that? Oh yes, that's my okay. next slide. Okay. Uh, I don't have to convince the audience here how uh, the, the, the benefit that the low rank will bring us. Uh, but uh, in a very simplified Velasov setting, uh, this is my equation. And, um, and I assume that my solution at the current time level, it has this representation, this Smith decomposition. Now, how do I update my solution at the next time step? Uh, the, num the basic numerical methods, such as the forward Euler method, it says that it's Fn, which is this term, minus delta t, the right-hand side of this PDE operators. And this PD operators, it has this special chronicle product structure that when you take the x derivative, you take the x derivative on the basis here. When you do the v dot, you can take the Hadamard product of v with your existing v basis here. The other term has the similar, very friendly uh, structure here, so that in this one time step update, um, you could uh, go through an uh, add basis procedure where the pink part is the basis and then the coefficients from your Fn. The blue part is the added basis uh, you have 
uh, from the discretization on the right hand side of your PDEs. The blue parts they are not necessarily orthonormal, uh, but you could uh, perform QRs and a sequence operation, and then you can perform uh, the SVD truncation on this is 3R by 3R small matrix uh, to realize update of the basis and then the reduction uh, on the um, uh, and the truncation on the unnecessary basis. And here the dx and dv, it's the global, it could be global or local differentiation operator, you apply it on this global basis here. And this comes from CFD. Um, it's a bit technical, I'm going to skip that. So the second step is SVD truncation. Uh, so one can perform QR and have the R here, and this R and the other R together with this diagonal matrix, one can perform SVD, and then one can apply this orthonormal basis with the other one, and then one will end up with a completely new set of orthonormal basis uh, for the next time step. And one can also realize the optimal um, truncation. We can truncate out the, re uh, the redundancy modes uh, to have uh, good efficiency. So this is how we leverage the right-hand side of the PDE operators and to update our basis in each of the time step. I only talk about for the Euler, but you could imagine that this uh, could in principle be generalized to high-order multi-step methods or range quota methods, and we did that. So now let me show you um, our simulation result on the Velasov equation, uh, which starts from a rank one initial condition and the SVD truncation threshold is 10 to negative 4. And uh, as the time goes, you can see that uh, our method could adaptively capture the rank increase uh, of um, the filamentation structure developed with the solution. And our method could adaptively capture that rank increase. So the solution is not necessarily low rank, but the methodology will be able to capture the rank increase and also decrease. So, so there's, I understand it's a discrete grid you have, right? So there's the, no you, discrete. discrete grid in space and velocity. The an accident. Yes, or yes. There so there's no need to kind of put a cut in the space of functions you allow for your basis, because that could be another option, I guess, right? To have continuous x and v. Yeah. We don't have that. Have oh, yeah, it's discrete. You, 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 so in, in my work, we assume the greater points. Oh. as a product of greater points in all dimensions. Yes, in this, in this formulation you had, you could think you could think you take a subset of possible functions, right. which you take as a basis set, right. and then you truncate the functions. Right, right, right. You don't do that. No, no. We, 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 do the discrete, uh, we, we do the discretization. Is, is um, there a reason or it's just a talk that you do? Um, that's the, 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 the basic of our numerical discretization, like uh, the computational PDEs. That's what typically what we do. Uh, okay. previously, is, that, is that something which sticks against taking a basis of functions and working with that, say Fourier basis or whatever? Um, yeah, Fourier basis. It, if you do the Fourier basis, then you go to the traditional tr spectral method. And then the idea here is that uh, you take a dimension, uh, you take a problem dependent basis that will allow you to explore better the low rank structure within the PDE solution. But you have to think more about the problem, that's kind of that. Yeah, we, we, have to take it in, okay. we, we have to take it into the look on uh, the PDE Sorry. structures and take advantage of that. <laughs> Um, so, when, uh, yes? <laughs> so for Runge Kuta implementation, do you directly apply SB on the sum of like, four different terms? Um, yes, you could. Um, so, uh, I, I didn't talk about it, I, I missed that slice, but here, uh, we, in fact, we use the second order multi step method. Uh, later on, we use the IMAX Runge Kuta method. And um, for efficiency consideration, you could do the truncation on each of the Runge-Kutta intermediate stages. But just be careful that um, the, the, the SVD truncation threshold, you want to set it to be low enough so that it will not uh, um, uh, affect your, uh, affect your uh, Runge-Kutta special cancellation error within the intermediate stages. Yeah, but, but there will be like some of um, low rank metrics as we, which will be like additive rank. Then you have, like I said, you sum of four different R rank, then you right. more R, then you truncate it at right. the R again. Right, but, right. But you can, but you consider like feeding thing? 
But spinning is a conventional thing in the quantum time integration on the room computer. Like if we have four different ranks and then with the initial guess, there's a beating thing. Oh, okay. What you didn't do, you just just yeah, I just I, I just sum up all the terms and then I will perform the SVD truncation upon that. Yeah, uh, I, we could follow up more later. All right. Um, so we extend uh, just what I explained at 1D1V, but utilizing the hierarchical tackle decomposition of the tensors. Uh, for this very simple linear direction uh, problem for D, uh, and uh, we do the mesh refinement, uh, and it's a lot of degree of freedom. Uh, and then we can see very clean second order convergence. And this second order convergence comes from the second order multi step method that we employ uh, for the temporal discretization. And the nice thing we observe is that our CPU time uh, with the mesh refinement is only doubled. Um, every uh, every uh, mesh um, refinement. And so this is a strong indication of on the overcoming uh, curse of dimensionality when the solution display the low rank structure. All right, so uh, I hope now I uh, show you how we build our low rank solvers or adaptive rank solvers based upon the, the traditional method, the traditional CFD method uh, that will inherit high order spatial and temporal convergence. Uh, it will inherit uh, the st stability property of the uh, traditional methods whenever they can do it. Um, this is the explicit time stepping that we are talking about. We extend it to the high dimensional problem, and it shows that it overcomes the curse of dimensionality. Uh, what are the issues I'm going to address uh, in the remaining part of this talk is, uh, first of all, when you perform the SVD truncation, you truncate out the redundant mode, but you also lost the conservation. The conservation that are important from the physics. Uh, the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. So how can we preserve that part? Uh, secondly, is that I haven't talked about how do we do things implicitly. Uh, when it is an implicit scheme, how can we look for the basis and therefore the coefficients uh, in an efficient way? Um, so first of all, let me talk about how to do the conservation. And uh, the algorithm that we propose is the so-called the low Mac projection, which stands for locally macroscopic conservative uh, projection. Um, so um, we, if we take our kinetic equation, and for example, the Velasov equation, and we take the first few moments, then we, uh, we will arrive at the macroscopic moment equations, standing for the conservation of the charge density, uh, uh, the charge density, the current density, and then the energy. And, uh, and here you can see that there is the flux terms uh, for which, for people from the CFD, they will know that uh, if you could discretize those spatial derivative terms by some flux difference with uniquely defined flux as their interface, then you could realize the con local conservations. Uh, and have a good uh, capture of uh, the conservation laws. And so we want to leverage uh, our understanding on the macroscopic um, uh, systems uh, for the kinetic equation. Um, so um, the issue I highlighted here is in red. Uh, it, it will be lost in the SVD truncation step, and then we propose a special truncation. And the general idea is very, very simple. Uh, that is that we take our updated solution, let's say Fn plus 1, before truncation. Uh, then uh, we will decompose it into two parts, F1 and F2. Um, the F1 parts represent an orthogonal projection of our updated higher rank solution, for example, the rank 3R1, onto the subspace spent by 1 v and v square in the velocity space. And this space, it will make sure that the mass, momentum, and energy is conserved. So F1, we will do a projection of F1, that is the projection onto this subspace W of our pre-compressed Fn plus 1 solution. 
After that, the F2, the remaining part, it will have the zero mass momentum and kinetic energy, and we can perform the regular SVD truncation to truncate out the redundancy, the data redundancy in this process. And F1, it has this is three bases in the V direction. So the F1 in the matrix case, it's rank three, and then you can do um, the truncation on the F2 here. Uh, yes? Uh, could you explain again why you choose uh, the subspace to be one V and V squared? This is base. Uh, this is uh, basically because uh, that the way we obtain our macroscopic conservation laws is to take our kinetic equation and then take the inner product with one V and V squared to arrive at this moment equation. So in order to conserve the mass, momentum, and energy, uh, we particularly look for the space uh, in this um, uh, spent by this a few bases. So um, in order to perform the projection, we have to properly define our inner product spaces. And in particular, uh, because we consider the space in the V direction, and we know that the probability density function for the particles in the velocity direction, um, they have uh, the exponential decay property as V goes to infinity. And so because of that, we introduced the weight function uh, W that is this exponential of minus V uh, squared divided by 2 to ensure that the F1 uh, projection we obtained will have the proper decay as a V goes to infinity. But this is a technical part. Um, in the end, the construction of F after the projection, it enjoys this very simple formula that F1 uh, equals a Maxwellian function, the weight function we introduce here. Uh, the basis in the v direction is 1 v and v square, whereas the basis from the x direction, uh, they come from the macroscopic uh, charge density, current density, and then the energy. So in terms of implementation, it's just this one layer that you could uh, use to construct your F1. Uh, after you have the F1, the remaining part, F2, then you can perform uh, the weighted SVD truncation to truncate out uh, the redundancy. So this is um, uh, the algorithm flow chart. Uh, how do we go from the pre-compressed solution F uh, to a compressed solution, uh, the new F? Uh, then we compute our F1. Uh, we then take, uh, compute our F2 as a remaining part, we perform the weighted SVD truncation, and then now we update our uh, solution in the low rank or adaptive rank fashion. So uh, this is again the bump on tail instability problem, again the same problem as I, what I showed you just now. Uh, upper, two, upper two plots is how the total mass uh, evolve as a function of time, and for different mesh, you can see that um, the total mass with SVD truncation without the conservative projection, it's around 10 to a negative 4, which is around the SVD truncation threshold that we put it in here. Whereas if you perform the SVD uh, conservative projection, uh, then the total mass as a function of time and total momentum as a function of time, it's more around 10 to a negative 12. And this is an indication of the effectiveness of our projection. Uh, however, because the, even the full rank method, the energy is not conserved, but we also want to realize the energy conservation in our setting uh, in order to prevent the unphysical plasma self-heating or cooling. Uh, so this is the plot of how the energy uh, evolve as a function of time, how the total energy evolve as a function of time. Again, even with a conservative projection, uh, it is conserved only around 10 to negative 4. And now we propose this low macro projection, uh, which is um, to utilize the macroscopic conservation laws. And in this multi-scale settings, we will pass our low rank or adaptive rank representation for our probability density function f here to compute 
the flux function for the macroscopic conservation loss in a low rank uh, efficient fashion. And then we will update our macroscopic variables. After we update these macroscopic variables, we could use it as a reference and then project our low rank solution F back into a manifold defined by those updated macroscopic conservation laws. And um, by, by this process, now we could realize the energy conservation at the machine precision level. This is 10 to negative 14. This is how the momentum, total momentum, evolve as a function of time. This is how the total energy evolve as a function of time. And for the different type of meshes and for um, different SVD truncation threshold, we could uh, preserve precisely um, the total energy, mass, and momentum at the level of machine precision. All right, so um, that is uh, about uh, how we realize um, the conservation. Uh, next, let me uh, briefly talk about uh, talk about the uh, how do we treat uh, the implicit schemes, um, and in particular uh, with um, Joseph and Lucas. Uh, we propose this reduced augmentation implicit low rank methods and we apply it to the focal plank models and convection diffusion models. Um, so this is the focal plank model uh, to describe the possible collisional operators between different particle species. Um, so just to simplify the discussion, we consider the kinetic model only in the velocity spaces. Uh, and on the right hand side, we see uh, kind of the convection terms and then the diffusion terms with respect to the velocity space. And again, we consider things only now in terms of the matrices, uh, the 2D. And if we put this, perform the numerical discretization of my F into the velocity spaces, uh, then I will be able to write uh, down the semi-discretized scheme as this matrix differentiation uh, equation. Uh, where we could uh, employ um, explicit treatment on certain terms on the right-hand side of F, uh, or sometimes implicit treatments because of the stiffness on the uh, certain terms on, on the right-hand side of your PDEs. And in particular, if we look at the diffusion terms and employ the implicit treatment, and a very prototype problem is the heat equation, um, then we could uh, uh, write down the differential equation as this matrix differential equation where the D1 could be the second order spatial derivative applied on the column operators of F and then the D2 could be the second order differentiation operator applied on the row, uh, uh, row directions, row basis on, um, on this F matrix. And again, we want to make the assumption that uh, our PDE solution F enjoy the low rank format where we will look for the basis in the X direction, in the other direction we call Y here, and then S is like the SVD um, coefficients. So um, again, we adopt a very traditional methods of discretization that uh, we first perform spatial discretization on tensor product of grid points and then we perform time discretization. To perform the time discretization, one could uh, use the Dirk time discretization to have the high order uh, in time, implicit in time. Uh, so this could all be done, and I will show you the numerics. But just to explain our idea, uh, we are going to, um, I'm going to only present the backward Euler uh, time integrators. So this is a backward Euler time stepping on the matrix differential equation that I showed you earlier on. Um, again, here you can think about it as a very simple heat equation. And then D1 and D2 are the differentiation, the second order derivative in the x and y directions. This system of uh, mat linear matrix equation, the unknowns are the basis in the x direction 
basis in the y direction and then the coefficient s. And how do we recover it? Um, because this is a collaboration with Louis, uh, Lucas um, and Kammer, where he's from the dynamic low rank approach, um, that we leverage what the dynamic low rank has been doing in updating the basis. Uh, but again, the order of uh, doing the projection and discretization is different from the dynamic low rank. Um, here, if, you, if, if some of you are familiar with the dynamic low rank notation, where they have the K, L, and S step, so the, for the K step, they will evolve um, the dynamics um, in the x direction, in one direction, by performing the projection around the rest of the dimensions. And in particular, because um, this is an implicit setting, we will perform the projection uh, onto the basis explicitly defined uh, by the current time step um, that is no. Then we will end up with a, a Sylvester equation um, that is large in one dimension, but it's a small size in the other dimension. The K here, we could uh, evolve it and solve it efficiently. And after that, one can perform a QR to collect the autonomous basis um, in this process so that we can update the basis um, for the future. Um, this is a backward Euler, but in this one time step update, um, if we only collect the basis at the time step Tn plus 1, and in this process, this is uh, rank R, we will not increase um, the, the rank or the number of uh, bases in this K step. So what we are doing is that we, we, we perform an augmentation in the sense that we keep our updated bases and we also collect our bases from the previous time step we collect them all together so that we, we form a very conservative set of candidates uh, to be as rich as possible. Uh, but this two set of bases, they could be very closely aligned with each other. So we will perform some type of SVD truncation to truncate out the redundant mode. And in the end, we will arrive at a good approximation for the basis across this time interval from Tn to Tn plus 1. And this is how our terminology comes from. We first do the augmentation to include as many candidates as uh, possible, and then we, do, we perform the SVD reduction uh, so that we have the efficiency. Once the basis for, from all the dimensions are recognized, then we can perform the projection and evolve the coefficients. And this is the S step from the uh, dynamic low rank approach. Um, after that, we can uh, again perform a SVD type of truncation so that uh, in the end, our updated solution at the next time step is kind of optimal in terms of efficiency. Um, so I. 12 minutes, thank you. So um, I explained this idea at a very high level, uh, utilizing the backward Euler uh, time integrator, but we extended it to the general Dirk and also the IMAX schemes, implicit and explicit integrators. Um, the, the only thing that is different from the traditional grid-based me grid method is this low rank assumption or adaptive rank assumption that we insert so that uh, we hope to speed up um, the computation from the traditional method. Now let me show you our numerical results. Um, this is a very simple prototype problem. If you, uh, a convection diffusion problem, rotational problem, where our initial condition is this ellipsoid shape. As it rotates and gets diffused, uh, you will see that the rank uh, actually will increase and then decrease and so on and so forth. And our scheme of different IMAX methods where we apply explicit on the convection term here and implicit on the diffusion term here, um, it will be able to capture this rank increase and decrease dynamics. Um, this plot is how our numerical error um, decrease 
uh, with respect to the time stepping size delta t, and we see very clear first, second, and third order temporal convergence um, in this plot. Um, the right hand side of the plot is that we perform um, the projection, the conservative projection, so that the total mass as a function of time, they're conserved at the level of 10 to negative 13 for different IMAX uh, time integrators. Another example, swanning, uh, swanning deformation problem, uh, where the initial condition uh, for this uh, time-dependent problem, it starts from rank one, uh, but as uh, the solution deforms, uh, the rank will very quickly increase and then decrease, and uh, there will be a dynamic capture of that. Uh, our methods will be able to capture those and also realize the high-order temporal and spatial convergence uh, as uh, the traditional method in enjoys. This is the 2D, uh, 0D 2V uh, learner bernstein fokker planck equation, where the initial condition starts from two maxwelliums, and then it will uh, settle to the equilibrium of one maxwellian shape. Um, this is the snapshots of our solution in a different time, and this is how our different time integrators uh, realize the convergence to the uh, final maxwellian equilibriums as the time goes. Um, all right, so basically, um, I cover uh, the main uh, ingredients of, uh, of, our of our method in the matrix setting. And now, uh, this is about extending what we have from the matrix to the set tensor setting for the high dimensional PDEs. Um, there is a huge amount of literature, um, and the, the one that we learn mo most from is the one from the Hackerbrush uh, on the hierarchical Tucker tensor and also the tensor trend uh, format. Um, and uh, one advantage that we recognize is really the linear scaling uh, with respect to the dimension in terms of the storage complexity and, um, and also uh, in our PDE updates, uh, the computational complexity. Uh, so this kind of slice has been uh, he, uh, around the workshop uh, for many times, and uh, uh, I think that uh, it, it just needs um, very li little introduction uh, for the audience um, here. Uh, just to be particular for the problems we are solving, and assuming that we consider 2D in X and 2D in V in our kinetic models, this is the tensor tree structure that we are adopting. Uh, then we have a four-dimensional problem. We group a dimension uh, X1 and X2 into one node in the tree, and then the dimension V1 and V2 into another node on, on my tree, and then we have uh, further, the leaf node 1, 2 uh, are the x1 and x2, where we store all the bases uh, for each of the dimensions here on the leaf node, and then 3, 4 is the basis in the velocity directions. Uh, again, uh, the computational complexity uh, we enjoy very much from this community is the linear scaling with respect to the dimension and polynomial scaling with respect to uh, the rank. Um, this is the particular setting uh, in terms of the Velasov uh, Poisson system that we are working with. Uh, we take advantage of this hierarchical structure in terms of the SVD decompositions. And in particular, for the kinetic model, uh, the operators does enjoy this uh, tensor-friendly structure that um, the right-hand side operators on, on the PDEs we can perform dimensional-wise uh, uh, differentiation and dimension-wise uh, head model product uh, to get the new tensors, uh, tensor tree from the discretization on the right-hand side of our PDEs. And then we can uh, leverage the existing uh, truncation algorithm uh, so that uh, we could have uh, the rank reduction in updating our basis. Uh, so this is... Um, Another tree structure on the, uh, that we dis utilize to discretize the right-hand side of our Velasov equation. 
uh, we use the uh, HTACA MATLAB toolbox uh, from the Questioner and uh, Tobler uh, in our implementation. And uh, uh, thank you. Uh, and we also perform uh, the mass momentum and energy conservation truncation uh, in this uh, tensor tree setting, which is um, rather involved, but I'm going to skip the technical details. Uh, so now let me present you uh, our numerics uh, result where uh, we use this algorithm uh, on the 2D, 2V nonlinear velocity of Poisson equation. Uh, this is the weak Landau damping. Um, this plot is how the electric energy decay exponentially in time. And for the weak Landau damping, this is well known with the linearized analysis that it enjoys this uh, exponential damping in time. Uh, for different meshes, we were able to capture this exponential decay uh, of the electrical energy in time. On the left-hand side, we show you the hierarchical rank uh, in the tensor tree that uh, we have. And the CPU time in this process to do the 2D, 2V plus time simulation with the mesh refinement, we find that the CPU time, it's only roughly doubled every time we do the mesh refinement um, in all the 4D spaces. And this is a very significant speed up if you come from the traditional uh, grid-based, uh, mesh-based uh, simulation point of view. Um, for the strong Landau damping, where the solution will develop filamentation structures, meaning that your adaptive rank algorithm uh, will rapidly have rank increase in time. Uh, here we show you how the rank will increase for different meshes. And you will see that it will kind of very rapidly increase uh, in the hierarchical rank in those non-leaf nodes. And because um, Wei performed this simulation only on his laptop, we cannot afford to have the rank growth. Uh, so we set the maximum rank to be 32, and we will truncate out uh, all the ranks that is larger than 32 on all the uh, tree nodes. Uh, but in the end, um, the, uh, if we take uh, the cross sessions of our solutions and plot it out, we get very satisfactory result that uh, we capture the filamentations um, that benchmark very well from the full grid method and with a much lower computational complexity. Uh, lastly, uh, let me show you uh, that if we do not perform uh, the conservative projection, the total mass, momentum, and energy, it will conserve only around the level of uh, the SVD truncation threshold. But if we perform the conservative SVD truncation, then the total mass, total momentum in two directions, and total energy, as a function of time, it all conserved around the level of machine precision. And this is something that is not even achieved for the full rank method, as far as we know. Um, so just to summarize, uh, we talk about uh, how do we speed up the traditional grid-based method by inserting the low rank or adaptive rank assumption into um, uh, uh, into our numerical scheme. We talk about explicit schemes, implicit schemes, up, uh, IMAX schemes, and we also talk about how do we uh, conserve the macroscopic conservation loss. Um, our ongoing work uh, together with my uh, current PhD student, Hamad, and our collaborator at Los Alamos is to develop the quite of subspace approach for the implicit tensor integrations, and also um, uh, in uh, a bigger context of uh, multi-scale plasma simulations, uh, we work on, uh, again, inserting this low rank assumption in order to speed up the traditional multi-scale solvers. Um, with that, I will stop and take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you.